Okay. Well, welcome all once again. Lesson two on the New Testament. Do we have the right books? Are they inspired? Can we trust them? There's actually a lot more involved than that, but that's part of it. So this is Scott Caldwell with WFR Church live stream. Uh, I have included my email. Let me remind you if later, if this is posted on uh, a website, then if you ever want to communicate, the way to do that is not to do it on the site, but just to come directly to my email. Likewise, by the time they're posted, well, by the time the last video is posted and the end is done, we'll put up the PDF and people will be able to download it, but sometimes people have trouble finding it because I'm not sure how they do that. And if that's the case, you email me, I will send you a copy. So let's note here, in the first lesson, we discussed why we know we have the right books in the New Testament. Very important subject, and we're not through with that yet. That's going to be also about half of this lesson as well. Then in lesson two, and this, uh, as we go through this lesson two, we're going to move on not only examining this subject, we're going to address the question, can we trust the accuracy of the biblical text? That's one thing to say we have the right books. There's something else to say, well, okay, we got all these manuscripts. Are they accurate? Can we actually trust them? We'll begin that part of that study later as we go uh, through this lesson. So let's move to where we need to begin. So we're still in the exact same study, just further along than we were in the first lesson. We're talking about, do we have the right books in the Bible? More to be said. So here's a question we need to think about. Why did it take longer for some inspired books to be accepted? Well, various factors account for the reason some books took longer to be recognized as inspired by the churches throughout the Roman Empire. One would be the time of writing. Those books that were written later in the first century did not have a chance to be copied and circulated widely until sometime in the second century. A book that was written in 50 AD had a 40-year head start on one that's written in 90 AD. So a later time of writing invariably leads to a later time of copying and circulating among the ever-growing number of churches. Just think, more churches are coming along all the time as people converted to Christ. We have more and more churches now to, to share these copies with. If a church had not received a copy of a book, it would not be in a position to accept it yet. So in the first century especially, we have the number of churches growing that copies need to be made for. Books are being written over a long period of time between about 50 to 90, 95 AD. So obviously the ones that are written later, it's gonna take longer for those to get copied and be spread out amongst the different churches. So in the first century, that's gonna be some of the, the major issues. It's taking time to spread out to different churches in the Roman empire. There's new churches being created. Some books are written later than others, and it's taking, of course, longer to get those out. There's gonna be some other issues that come up, especially in the second century and after. And one of them will be questions of authorship. Concerns about a book were often not based on the quality of teaching or the impression it made, but on the question of authorship. The original recipients always knew the author and therefore immediately accepted a book as inspired if it was from, from an apostle, an associate of an apostle, or a recognized prophet. But Christians many decades later may not have known the identity of the author and therefore questioned the validity of the book. Their hesitancy to immediately accept books as inspired shows they took the process of acknowledging scripture to be serious. The fact that people are stopping and thinking, well, okay, who is this? And why should I accept this book? Well, that's a good thing. They're, they're doing some due diligence here. Now, that's not gonna be all the books. There was not generally an issue for Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the letters of Paul, but it could raise questions for the anonymous book of Hebrews and a few others. Hebrews was anonymous, but the original recipients knew the author's identity and the reason they accepted him as an apostle, an apostle's associate or a prophet, unlike some churches in later years. So the book of Hebrews initially sent to some group of Christians here. They know who sent it to them. They know the author and they know why they're accepting the book. They go a few decades down uh, the, the road here and some Christians get this book and they're saying, okay, this book of Hebrews, this interesting book, who, who wrote this? 
And, and why should I accept it as inspired? Because now maybe they don't know exactly. So they're, they're asking these questions, as they should ask. Let's look at some of the other books. James was and is still considered by many to be the brother of Christ and not the apostle James. Well, that calls those who did not know him to be a prophet to question the inspiration of the book. If the apostle James, fine, he's, he's an apostle, God's inspired apostle, writing his book, probably would have been no question. But if it's, if it's not him, if it's Jesus' brother, well, okay, is he a prophet? Why, why should we accept this? Uh, because the book of James was written to Jews, it may have received less circulation outside of Jewish circles and therefore was unknown by many Gentile churches. So there's another issue. It's, it's a Jewish book, and it seems to be sent initially to just Jewish churches. And if that's the case, it may have really taken a long time to get around to the Gentile churches. And so it was kind of a new thing with them. And uh, again, took longer to recognize. Revelation is a unique book that was written by John. If y'all read Revelation, you know it's a unique book. He identifies himself as the servant John, who was their brother instead of the Apostle John. He never says the Apostle John. He says, Servant John, he says, their brother in tribulation. But this calls some people in later years to question the identity of John. Which John is this? If it's not John the Apostle, is this a prophet? Why should we accept it? There was also some stigma attached to the book because of how it was used by some heretical groups. We might could say the same thing today. <laughs> what do you think? The issue with 2 Peter was a little different, and it was at times scrutinized because of a perceived lack of similarity with 1 Peter. Later, there were questions about the date of writing based on internal references, which caused some to think it was written after Peter's death. These arguments were only based on conjecture. It seems that 2 Peter has been scrutinized longer and harder than any New Testament book. And the conclusion has repeatedly been that there's no reason to doubt it was written by the Apostle Peter. Other books that were occasionally disputed by some include 2 John, 3 John, and Jude. 2 and 3 John are stated to be written by the elder, which made the authorship questionable for some. Now, the ones who initially received it, they knew who it was from. He knew them so well, he could just call himself the elder. They knew it, but then people decades later say they don't know. Some people were concerned about Jude making references to the apocryphal books of Enoch and the Testament of Moses. So uh, there's a few verses I note there that are said to be a reference to these apocryphal books there. Well, these allusions seem to be similar to Paul citing heathen poets who made statements he agreed with. It was not a claim they were inspired. Paul will quote a heathen poet to make a point. They know the poet. They already understand it and agree with it. He's just simply saying, I agree with this point. It seems that James is doing the same thing here in his reference to the books of Enoch and the Testament of Moses. He's not claiming they're inspired. He's just saying, you know these books and you, you already understand this. And I'm just saying I'm agreeing with him. These are all short one chapter books. And in fact, second and third John are the shortest books in the Bible. Well, they're only one chapter. Because of their limited teaching and perceived lesser value, they were likely shared less often with other churches. One chapter, very short, nothing much new said. You can see why it didn't seem imperative to pass these around as much. The general consensus on authorship is that the apostles wrote at least 21 of the 27 New Testament books. That would be the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of John, the 13 letters of Paul, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, and Revelation. Some would still argue a little bit. Some would say Hebrews was written by an apostle. There are early church fathers who uh, thought it might have been written by Paul. Revelation, some today will still argue that it wasn't written by an apostle. So, uh, but it makes all the sense in the world that we would have 21 or, or possibly even more uh, 22 letters written by an apostle because these the apostles were the Jesus disciples who were with him over three years, who watched him heal people, who saw his death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. They heard his teaching and they were able to share his teaching. Who else would be your main people to go out sharing that truth except the people who were there and were eyewitnesses? The Gospels of Mark and Luke 
and the book of Acts were written by associates of apostles who likely functioned as prophets and scribes. Mark, uh, we even have uh, early church fathers talking about how he was connected to Peter and he wrote down uh, information from Peter. Uh, Luke was connected with Paul and, uh, and also wrote the book of Acts and at times talked about being there with Paul. The authors of Hebrews, James, and Jude would seem to be prophets unless someone could ever prove Hebrews was written by an apostle. So that brings up a good question. And this is one of those timely questions we have today. Well, what about the lost gospels? Why aren't any of them in the Bible? Those books that are not included in the New Testament that some claim are inspired by God are usually called the apocryphal gospels, sometimes called the lost gospels. Some contend that these books were widely read and equally accepted by the early church, along with the books we have in our Bible today, but were cast aside by Constantine and the Council of Nicaea. We've already seen why that's not true. They're often called the lost gospels because they were not included in the New Testament, and several of them were rediscovered in the last 100 years. They were not excluded from the canon of inspired books. They were never included in it, is the point. Many of them record only fragmentary incidents from the life of Christ. So why aren't any of these lost gospels in our Bible? Well, there's some great answer to this. The most direct answer is that none of them were written in the first century. They were all written in the second century or later. Therefore, none of them were written by apostles or their associates because all of them died in the first century. That also means they represent writings by people who are separated by a longer period of time from the, from the events they claim to report on. They're much further away in time to the events of Jesus' ministry that they claim to report on. Any apocryphal gospel that claims to be written by a first century disciple, such as Peter or Thomas, we have the gospel of Peter, gospel of Thomas, well, it's lying about its authorship. It's written in the second century. They died in the first century. So obviously that's not true. These facts are all the reasons needed to reject every one of these books. They're indication the church ceased acknowledging new books as scripture after the first century. Remember, we talked about this Muratorian fragment from 180 AD. In it, um, besides a list of uh, books accepted as inspired, it indicated the book Shepherd of Hermes, Hermes was helpful, but not inspired. And it gave a reason for it. One reason it was rejected is because it was written in the second century instead of the time of the apostles, indicating the canon of the New Testament scripture was considered closed after the apostles died, which would make all the sense in the world. Another reason to reject many of the apocryphal gospels is that the nature of their teaching is often contrary to the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the inspired letters that had already been received. These inspired books constituted a foundation of true doctrine by which the apocryphal writings were compared. That's why Jesus has his disciples. They become his apostles. Not only were they there and saw and heard him teach over and over, he told them the spirit would bring to their remembrance. If they're gonna teach and share these things, they're eyewitnesses. That's the people who are gonna give the foundation of two true doctrine based on Christ. So when we have books that contradict that, well, that's just a red flag right there that something's wrong. You're contradicting these inspired books. It's obvious that many of these apocryphal writings contradict sound doctrinal teaching. Some are what's called Gnostic writings. They were connected to a sect that emerged within the Christian movement in the second century. They claim to have secret knowledge about God that only they possessed. And they considered the God of the Old Testament to be an evil deity who was not the supreme ruler. Christ was said to be a separate creature from the creator. Physical matter was considered inherently evil. And therefore, they claimed Christ did not have a physical body. He had not come in the flesh. Some of this false teaching was starting to get going at the end of the first century. Therefore, in 1 John, John will address some of this. He will say, if anyone uh, says, Christ did not come in the flesh. He is not from God. He's already starting to deal with this era that's starting to come out. Much of this Gnostic teaching in my mind, it's what I call New Age Christianity. It's all about you're your own God, and you just need greater wisdom and truth to guide yourself, and you're going to save yourself, and it's, it's 
but similar to mess that goes on today. <clears throat> they claim that Christ did not save by virtue of his death on the cross, but by communicating knowledge that would, could save those who possessed it. You don't need Jesus' death on the cross. You, you need this knowledge. They don't record Jesus telling how he could save people from their sins. They have Jesus telling people how they could save themselves. Many of these represent Jesus as being less concerned with showing that he's divine and more concerned with teaching people to find the divine spark within themselves. All of this to me is all too similar to the New Age stuff we see today. Some apocryphal books that did not promote these Gnostic heresies, some were not Gnostic Gospels, were referenced by early church fathers because they were considered helpful, although not inspired. When the early church fathers did mention the apocryphal Gospels, it was usually to condemn them. No apocryphal gospel was a serious contender for a spot in the New Testament canon at any time. None of them are included in the list of received and accepted books near the end of the second century. No manuscript combined an apocryphal gospel with a canonical gospel or the canon of inspired books. Uh, you have, uh, we'll talk about numerous manuscripts out there, uh, some average 350 pages long, they will, uh, they will often combine Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in that manuscript. They will never combine a apocryphal gospel with Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Rarely were they accepted by a church father. Many contain blatant heresy that contradicts inspired books. One way to evaluate the popularity of the apocryphal gospels is by looking to see how these books were cited or referenced in letters and writings. The early church fathers wrote a bunch and they quoted the Bible a bunch. You can reconstruct almost the whole New Testament from quotes in their writings. And every once in a while, they, they referred to an apocryphal gospel. Well, let's see how that compared. The early church father, Clement of Alexandria, cited the canonical gospels, the inspired gospels in our Bible, thousands of times. And the apocryphal gospels, he cited 15 times. That shows a pretty big distinction, doesn't it? Another way to measure their popularity and acceptance is by the number of manuscripts left behind. When we look at manuscripts from the second and third centuries, we find four times as many manuscripts of the gospels in our Bible as we find for apocryphal gospels. There are more manuscripts of the gospel of John from this period than for all of the apocryphal gospels combined. So in the second and third century, you have more manuscripts of the Gospel of John than of every apocryphal gospel combined. Well, that says something, doesn't it? So the apocryphal gospels were not nearly as popular as some claim. You know, the claim we talked about some like to make, they'll say in the beginning there was many Christianities and there's different beliefs and there's different books, uh, the inspired books we know in the Bible. And they claim many of these books are around, but they're not going to be written until the second century and beyond. And they're saying everybody had them and believed them equally, and it was all equal and the same. Well, all this shows, no. Number one, they weren't around the first century. Number two, they're surely not treated equally. They're not quoted equally. They're not finding manuscripts of them equally. They're not nearly as popular as people want to claim. There are distinctions that can be noted between the manuscripts of inspired books and apocryphal books. The early church took the copying of scripture very serious. And they made use of professional scribes. I read where many noted that sometimes slaves were trained to be scribes. Uh, wealthy people often had their own scribe. And there's various indications uh, that scribes were used in many of the manuscripts of the New Testament. Romans notes it was written by Paul by, for Paul by a scribe named Tertius. It mentions that at the end. Paul's dictating, he's writing. Inspired New Testament books were handwritten on codices which are similar to books and were more formal. So instead of just having this long roll, uh, it was put together, you know, like we think it was a book. It was just kind of becoming a new thing and it became the, uh, the better thing, the more professional thing. The quality of writing in copies of scripture is more careful and distinct as if done by scribes with notations for punctuation and paragraphs. So many of these books I was reading and studying for all this, they even show pictures of the manuscripts and saying, you can look at this and tell this was done by a scribe. Some would say, how do you know if it's an auto, the original autograph or not? Well, it's got scribal notations in it, which is the way a professionally trained scribe would do it. And so the copies of scripture compared to these apocryphal gospels, they, they looked professional by comparison. 
The presence of standard abbreviations in the copies of scripture indicates planning and uniformity as would be expected by scribes. Apocryphal books were more often written on manuscript rolls, sometimes on used ones or the back of an existing roll. So apocryphal writings often had the appearance of being less important. And in the books I looked at, they would put them side by side. So you look at these two and, and this one just looks better, more professional. Said, and that's the characteristic of the New Testament books compared to the apocryphal books. Strangely enough, many people who think the apocryphal gospel should be in the Bible have never read them. Now, if they're scholars, they have. But many other people who talk about, yeah, all these books, they're, you know, they should all be in the Bible. Well, they've usually never read them. Sometimes all it takes is a quick look to become aware of unorthodox statements that are contrary to New Testament teaching. So sometimes all you have to do is read a couple of verses in some of these to say, well, I can see now why it's not accepted because it has a teaching that's contra contradictory to the New Testament and the Old Testament. Let's take a quick look at two popular apocryphal gospels, the Gospel of Thomas, which is very popular, and the Gospel of Peter. Here are the last three sentences in the Gospel of Thomas. You can go online and look them up. And as we go through this, I want you to ask yourself, am I hearing anything that seems strangely contradictory to normal New Testament teaching? So it says, Simon Peter said to him, him is Jesus. Simon Peter said to him, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. There's strike one. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her a male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. And we'll say that's strike two against being inspired. And then the last part, for every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's just rather shocking, isn't it? This has no, nothing similar to God's inspired word as we know it. So if that's all you ever knew, about the Gospel of Thomas should say. This sounds contradictory to the Bible. Then when you learn the Gospel of Thomas is not written by an apostle or his associate, but is written in the second century, well, that clinches it, doesn't it? It's rather evident that the Gospel of Thomas contains teaching contrary to the Old Testament writings, the teaching of Christ, as well as all inspired New Testament books. Bart Ehrman is a highly regarded atheist scholar. He often likes to debate uh, Christian scholars, and he likes to deny the inspiration of the Bible because he's an atheist. He acknowledges that the Gospel of Thomas was written in the second century, and he says it falsely attributes sayings to Christ. Well, he comes up with, I think, are some strange conclusions, but he's a scholar, and he will not deny facts. There's often scholars who will go out of their way to do their best to claim the Gospel of Thomas is written in the first century because they want to claim it was there in his poppers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he, he points out, no, it's written in the second century, and he even says it falsely attributes sayings to Christ. The Gospel of Peter, let's look at the Gospel of Peter. It discusses the event in which Christ came out of his grave. Jesus, it said, was taller than the heavens when he exited the tomb. He was taller than the heavens. The cross followed him out of the tomb. So here in the first century, the Romans crucify people who are criminals to the state. And when they get through, you're allowed to take your cross with you to your burial site. You know, that's kind of the crazy part, number one. But the cross is following him out of the tomb. So is, is it hovering? Is it walking? And a voice asked, did you speak to those who sleep? And the cross answered, yes, the cross is speaking. So apocryphal gospels were rejected because they're written in the second century and later by people who are not eyewitnesses. Many of them, like these, record fanciful nonsense and teaching that's contrary to that of Christ and the apostles. I had, a, I had just a comment that <laughs> it seems there was some men who weren't really happy about women, even back then, having a role in the church. <laughs> So yeah. Yeah. was that yeah. supposed to be part of the process of eliminating the uh, status of women? Hey, all I can say, it's heretical, unorthodox, uh, false gospel from the second century. Men, what is their problem? But it's rather evident, isn't it? You don't read this and say, 
Oh, I mean, just think people often think, yeah, the Gospel of Thomas should be in there. I don't think they've read this, you know, but yeah, it's, it's rather crazy. I have no idea where that comes from, but there it is. So, and the word, uh, they put it, the words in Jesus' mouth. So. To, to piggyback what Miss Judy just said, my, my, my Bible, where just about everywhere in the New Testament where it says brothers, um, it's also got a footnote that says brothers and sisters um as being the original translation so you know anyway it, it, it's some pretty crazy stuff but yeah. i like to think some people who just weren't sure that that ought to wake us all up shouldn't we but really not written by an eyewitness not written in the first century that's all anybody needs to know but number two look at some of the crazy stuff said so any other questions or uh, <clears throat> what about the book of maccabees <clears throat> was that just a Gnostic gospel? Well, no, because uh, the, the ones we're talking about are New Testament apocryphal gospels, the lost gospels. There's also Old Testament apocryphal gospels, and which they actually refer to as the Apocrypha. And most of this was written in the 200 years before Christ, and the first and second Maccabees are, fall into that. And uh, so uh, they were... In fact, first and second Maccabees three times say that prophecy has ceased, meaning there's no longer prophets speaking God's word at this point. So why someone considers these books to be inspired, I, I do not know. But we had talked about, I think last time, about how the, uh, the Jewish nation did not consider the Apocrypha to be inspired. Helpful books, and the Maccabees give some good history of the intertestamental period. Uh, Jesus and, and the uh, Pharisees accept the 39 books of the law and uh, the prophets and the writings, which do not include the Apocrypha. And it isn't until the 1500s that the Catholics begin to accept them for some reason as inspired and include them in their Bibles. Now, let's go back to this Council of Nicaea, see if we got this thing straight. How does the Council of Nicaea fit into all this? Well, the Council of Nicaea doesn't have anything to do with the determination of which books ended up in our Bibles. All such claims are false. The Roman Emperor Constantine called for a council of the Christian church that met in 325 AD. That is true. The main goal was to address a heresy that claimed Christ was not divine but was a created being. That was why they met. That was the issue. The council denounced this heresy and included in the Nicene Creed that Christ was of one substance with the Father to indicate his equality. The council did not vote on or provide a list of what books were considered inspired and part of the canon of scripture. None of that was any part of it. It is commonly claimed that Constantine and the council voted to approve the books they favored and they rejected the others, and none of this is true. Once again, even the distinguished atheist scholar, Bart Ehrman, who doesn't believe in this phrase in the Bible stated, the canon of the New Testament was ratified by widespread consensus rather than by official proclamation. Well, that's exactly what I'm saying, isn't it? Over time, the churches acknowledge the writings that came from apostles, their associates, or prophets in the first century, and on that basis is the basis the books became to be understood to be inspired. The Da Vinci Code movie that promotes this whole nonsense about the Council of Nicaea and the Lost Gospels being kicked out. Well, it turns out it's only a fictional movie, but then it is from Hollywood. It is a fictional story. It is a movie. So isn't that what we should expect? Now, still in this uh, same subject, let's think about this. The difficulty of denying the authorship of the New Testament books, because many try to deny that anyone who's claimed to, to write any of them did. Well, some claim the New Testament books that were, were not written by the authors they're ascribed to. Well, the first problem with this denial is that one of the primary reasons the churches received the books and accepted them as inspired is that they knew the authors. That's the whole reason they're accepting them. I know the author. I know he's either an apostle, he's an associate of apostle, or he's a prophet. That is the reason they accept them as inspired books, just like was done in the Old Testament. So to act like uh, these people didn't know what they're doing. See, you're, you're missing the whole point. That's the only reason they are accepting them. They knew them. They accepted them as God's spokesman, 
and they received their writings as God's inspired words. There's other practical arguments for accepting the authorship of the New Testament books as well. Let's look at the Gospels first. The Gospels are anonymous, like the Old Testament historical books, and that practice served to emphasize the subject matter over the author. When you read books of history in the Old Testament, it's not a letter. They don't give their name in the beginning, like we'll see in the letters in the New Testament. Well, the, the Gospels are books of history, so we're not surprised they do it just like the Old Testament uh, historical books. But every manuscript has the name of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John as the author in the title of the book without exception. Various church fathers acknowledged the Gospels were written by them, including Irenaeus in 180 AD and Tertullian in 207 AD. Celsus, a second century pagan opponent of Christianity, he accepted that the Gospels went back to Jesus' apostles. So there didn't seem to be really a lot of disagreement about this. Matthew and John were written by eyewitnesses. Mark and Luke were written by associates of eyewitnesses. Part of the beauty behind the Gospels being written in the first century is that the eyewitnesses were alive. They could provide quality control by denouncing any, any works falsely attributed to them. There's no indication that Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John ever declared they had nothing to do with the Gospel writings that bore their names. John was quick enough in his letters to speak out against those who taught twisted doctrines. Go read 1 John. Would he not also speak out against a gospel falsely attributed to him? Yet there's no record of him ever doing so. Mark was the associate of Peter. But Peter did not bother to note in his letters that someone falsely claimed to write a gospel in cooperation with him. Luke was the associate of Paul. But at no time in his letters does Paul give a rebuke against a false gospel by someone who claimed to be his associate. The same is true for the authorship of Paul's letters. If Paul had not written some of the letters that claimed to be authored by him, wouldn't he have been quick to set the record straight as he did concerning many other issues? In fact, he did this very thing in 2 Thessalonians when he addressed the claim, the day of the Lord had come. Paul told them not to be alarmed by the rumor of a spoken word or letter, making this claim that supposedly came from him because it did not. It wasn't even something he said or a letter. There was a rumor of a letter, and he thought it was important to denounce that in a letter that no such thing had come from him. Well, since he responded strongly to the very rumor of a false letter coming from him, wouldn't he have been even bolder in disputing an actual letter falsely ascribed to him? Yet there's no such rejection of his authorship of the letters that we have that are stated to be written by him. All these men traveled and visited with churches, and over time, they became aware of what inspired books the churches had received and were reading and teaching from. If there was an issue with any books attributed to them, it should have been mentioned in their writings. That never happened because they did, they did author the books attributed to them. So just think, here's Peter and John going around traveling and preaching and creating churches and visiting. Here's Paul on these different missionary journeys. And in time, these books are getting written and out there. And I'm sure there's times when they're with them that uh, they're either asking people about inspired books they've received or people are telling them. So what if you got the Apostle John here? And someone says, oh, John, I just want to let you know, I love your gospel. It is just so wonderful. And John says, John says gospel? What gospel? I didn't write a gospel. Well, I think we'd have heard about that, wouldn't we? But, you know, here they are. We have quality control. They're around in the first century. They see these things circulating. And is ever a mention made one time that there is a book falsely ascribed to me out there? Well, no, there's not. And yet Paul will make a comment if there's simply a rumor of a false letter ascribed to him. So another confirmation, the authors of the books we have, we, we, we know who the authors are. So here's the conclusion to this whole section, how we know we have the right books in our Bible. We have the inspired books that were received by the early church. They were not picked by Constantine or the Council of Nicaea. The churches that initially received the books always knew the identity of the authors and the reason they accepted their writings as inspired. They were accepted as inspired teachings because they were written by apostles who were eyewitnesses, their associates, or prophets. It seems the church ceased to acknowledge New Testament books as scripture if they were written after the time of the apostles in the first century. 
All of the inspired books in our Bibles were written in the first century and were close in time to the events that happened. None of the lost gospels should be in the Bible because they were not written in the first century and therefore were not written by eyewitnesses. Early in the second century, some churches in one part of the Roman Empire had already acknowledged all 27 New Testament books as being inspired. By the end of the second century, there were churches on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea that had received 25 of the 27 New Testament books. So a consensus was close to being reached by churches throughout the Roman Empire by the end of the second century, long before the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. So let's stop again here and see if we have any questions. I had a question. Okay. Uh, okay, this is Trevor's. Um... I, I I um got you got this class from your revelations class that you taught. Okay. And I, I, I just thought this this course was definitely for me because um I just lately I've had um problems trying to connect the old testament to the New Testament. And it was just for the reason, it, the title of this lesson, it was just for that reason, not knowing what books were accurate. Now, mm -hmm. what I wanted to ask you was, is it a difference between uh, books of the Bible, the, the Bible, let's just say the Bible, and the scriptures? Because, and I'm asking because I noticed that when um, Jesus, the prophets, the apostles, when they all spoke, they always spoke about referencing the scripture and not the Bible. Mm -hmm. And the scriptures contain more than the Bible. Am I correct? Uh, well, no, they... The, the word Bible is a, a word we have. They didn't use that word. Uh, what we call our Bible is equivalent to Scripture. They're both the same. And okay. we're going to get into that more as we work into further lessons. We'll talk about what does it mean to be inspired. And those books that are inspired by God are called Scripture. And those are the books we have in the Bible. But that is coming in a, a future lesson. Okay. Now, the second part to my question is, Okay, what if there is mention of a certain book in the 66 books of the Bible? Does that make it accurate? I, I, I'm not sure if I understood your question. Repeat that for me. Okay, in, in the 66 books of the Bible, what if there are some other books that were listed in the scriptures that was provided in the scriptures that's actually in the Bible. The Bible actually mentioned the book because I know for, um, I, I, there's some in the New Testament, but I was reading the Old Testament and I know that the war of the Lords, um, the prophet Nate, and stuff like that. And it's mentioned in the 66 books of the Bible, mm -hmm. but it's a part of the scriptures. Well, it depends on what you're talking about. In the Old Testament, you will see references where say, is this not written in the book of Jasher and such? So you, so you, it'll mention different writings. So you had different prophets who would write and would collect scripture. In fact, the first prophets were chroniclers of history. We don't actually get to what we call the prophets, the books of prophets still starting you know, around the, uh, uh, the, after King David. And so uh, many of these would be taken later and combined and put together into the books we have in our Bible. Now, when you get to the New Testament, it becomes a little different. You don't see that so much as you'll see, like I noted earlier, uh, some will say it looks like the book of Jude makes a reference to two books outside the Bible, the book of Enoch, the Testament of Moses, that were apocryphal books. Not that he's saying these are inspired books, but he's just simply pointing out this, this book makes a statement that I agree with, just like Paul referred to uh, poets at times who made a point that people knew, and he pointed out that he agreed with that point. He wasn't saying that person was inspired. And so it's a little different depending on if we're talking the Old or the New Testament. But as we get more into it here, I think it may answer some of your questions. 
So let's okay. switch gears here. Thank you for asking though. Let's switch gears because we've got, we've finished the part about, do we have the right books in the Bible? So now that leads to a second question. There's many layers we have to go through. Can we trust the accuracy of the Bible, biblical text? Do we have the original New Testament documents? We do not have any of the original New Testament writings, which are written in Greek and are called autographs. We have manuscript copies that are distinguished from the autographs by the presence of notes that scribes inserted into the margins of the text. So many scholars will note, you, you can often look at a manuscript, well, you would know it wouldn't be the autograph because it's got scribal notes in it. Plus number two, it's the book Paul, letter Paul wrote to Ephesus, and you find that this manuscript 200 miles from Ephesus, well, you get the impression it's a copy that was sent elsewhere too. So we can ask the question, how many copies of the New Testament books do we have? Well, we have an amazingly large number. There are more than 5,800 manuscripts of the New Testament books that total over 2 million pages. The average manuscript is over 350 pages long. Also, there's more than a million New Testament citations preserved in the writings of early church fathers, almost enough to restore the whole New Testament. Here's how notable ancient non-biblical works compare in the number of manuscripts that have been found. So the, the number one one would be Homer, the Iliad. They have 643 copies. Sophocles, 193 copies. Aristotle, 49. Tacitus, 20, compared to 5,800 manuscripts of the New Testament. Manuscripts of the New Testament books are a thousand times more plentiful than ancient secular writings. Compared to copies of non-biblical ancient writings, our New Testament copies are much written much closer in time to when the, the uh, originals were written. So we have 12 Bible manuscripts from the second century within 100 years of writing. The average length of time between the writing of non-biblical ancient works and their first existing copies is between 500 and 900 years. So you see the Bible is quite unique. We have thousands of copies. They treated this thing like it's sacred scripture from God, and they copied it, and they went through care with scribes to make it very accurate. And we have copies going all the way back to within 100 years of when all this happened. So this is just unheard of in all other ancient literature. No secular writings come close to the number of copies of New Testament scriptures and the limited period of time between the writings and the copies. So this brings us to another question. I'd like to address all the, the questions that are often brought up. Are there errors in the New Testament manuscripts? We have copies of the inspired books that were received by the early church and handed down to other churches. Because of the existence of thousands of New Testament manuscripts, we would expect there'd be some mistakes in copying. And that assumption is correct. Well, someone might say, well, how could there be mistakes in copying if the Bible's without error? What good is it if we had the right books, but we cannot trust them to be accurate? Well, those are good questions that are worthy of good answers. God inspired the original text. He did not inspire the copies, but he did work through history to make sure his inspired word would be trustworthy. There are a few things we need to understand about the nature of uh, variance. The first factor we should appreciate is how variants are defined. A variant is any difference between copies of the same text that are compared. Variants come in a wide variety of categories and most make no difference in the meaning or the ability to understand what's being communicated. But let's look at some different categories of variants. So we have some of what's called errors, or they're called variants by scholars. And it's any difference you note anywhere in any word in the same verse. So let's first look at spelling errors which is a misspelled word or an alternately spelled word. Most spelling errors are simply spelling variations, similar to the difference in the American spelling of color or the British spelling of color with a U. A common spelling error in Bible manuscripts concerns what is called a movable N, since the Greek word N is called a new, actually call it a movable new, we'll call it an N for our, uh, for our discussion. In Greek, if a word ends in an N, and the following word begins with a vowel, then the rule is to drop off the end from the ending of the first word. Uh, we do something quite similar, but opposite. 
between the articles a and an. If the following word begins with a vowel, you add the n. A dog, an apple. In their case, the following word began with a vowel, you drop the n. Well, in manuscripts, this was often done inconsistently. And some manuscripts recorded the n while it's, and some dropped it off. Such variations do not affect the meaning of the text or any translation of the text into a different language. They're harmless variations, but they can seem to be serious because of the way variants are counted. Each variant in every manuscript for the same verse is counted as an additional variant. So if you have 500 manuscripts and 200 of them differ by failing to properly drop the N off of one word in one verse, that counts as 200 variants, even though it only involves one word and not 200. We're only talking about the N on one word in one verse, but if 200 manuscripts don't drop it off, that counts as 200 variants, even though we're just talking about this one word. And it's as important as whether or not you say a apple or an apple that doesn't honestly make any difference in anything. Then you have word order changes, transposing the order of words. But changing word order can make a lot of difference in English because our sentences are based on word order, but it's not nearly as important in Greek. English sentences are based on word order, whereas Greek is based on the case of the word regardless of the order. One example would be if the words Jesus Christ were copied as Christ Jesus. There's no change in meaning, but it would increase the variant count because that would count as a variant. And for every manuscript that had that variant would count as a variant. Then you have adding or dropping definite, definite articles before proper nouns. Whether or not the article the is placed in front of a proper noun, such as a person's name, they would often put the in front of a person's name. Once you translate in this thing that you would drop the the anyway. Well, in Greek, sometimes the definite article the is placed before a person's name and sometimes it's not. In some manuscript copies, the article is left out when it had been present and some copies added the article when it had been absent. These are also harmless variations that do not affect the meaning of the verse, but they do add to the number of variants that are said to exist. Then you have abbreviations, abbreviating words and abbreviating them in different ways. Sometimes copyists abbreviated words, and technically that counts as variation, yet professional scribes often had standard ways of abbreviating that they did. Then you have nonsense readings. Those types of errors occur if a line's accidentally skipped. So if you go along reading, all of a sudden you think, well, something's wrong here. Well, they have, we have 5,800 manuscripts, right? You go compare and then you say, oh, okay, I'll see what happened. Scribe skipped a line. And so it's quite an obvious problem. Then you have singular readings, a change that only exists in one manuscript. Then you have the ones we should think about, changes in the meaning of the text. These are changes that make some difference in what the text is communicating. These variants affect the meaning of the text and are the only type that should generate any concern. These are the only variants anyone should have any thoughts about or concern at all. But as we shall see, even these changes often have little to no impact on the truth or doctrine that's being communicated. And in most cases, the correct variant can be determined so the original text can be re restored. So that brings us to the end of our class today. Let me... Uh, uh, turn off our